Welcome to episode 11 of Real Life, Real Gospel, sponsored by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida. My name is Josh Laborious. I am the host of this podcast, and every week we take a topic and we try to dissect what it looks like for a Christian to actually approach that topic in real life. That's where our name comes from. We have Real Life, Real Gospel. That's the title of this podcast. And the reason we do that, the reason I host this every week is because I think a lot of times when we're talking about faith and life, we we speak in ideals and we speak in, in theological, academic language that distances us from application to real life. So I do my best to avoid theological language, to avoid academic language, and very simply just look like what our faith looks like, which is a circular sentence, my apologies about that, but what our faith looks like when we apply it to our regular daily lives. So that's kind of what this show is all about. You can follow us on Spotify, on YouTube, on Podbean, on Google Podcasts, and on iTunes. We're on all of those platforms. So, whatever is most convenient for you, we are there for you. And this week, we're going to be discussing forgiveness. And this topic is courtesy of the Red Letter Challenge that we're going through in the 40 Days of Lent here at St. Paul. It's a devotional book and a small group guide, and we're preaching on it. And we're doing the podcasts on whatever the weekly topic is. You don't have to be going through the Red Letter Challenge for this podcast to be helpful, hopefully, or to apply to you. But that's where the topic comes from. Um, Usually, our topics come from listeners like yourself who either comment or they reach out to me via email or Facebook message. And I do my best to address topics that you guys are curious about, want to hear about, want to know about. But for these 40 Days of Lent, we are going through the Red Letter Challenge. And today's topic, as I said, is forgiveness. And when we talk about forgiveness, I I know I introduced the show by talking about how I'm going to avoid theological language. And forgiveness, I think, a lot of times is a theological word. We say it and we don't really think about what it actually means. So before I go into this podcast on forgiveness, I want to talk about the different ways that we define it and understand it. And I want to start by what Google says it means. If, if you search define forgiveness, well, first of all, if you search define forgiveness, what you get is to be forgiven or um, the act of, of forgiving or something like that. Like it's a circular definition. But if you search define forgive, what you get is um, that forgiveness is stopping or to forgive is to stop feeling angry or resentful towards someone for an offense, a flaw, or a mistake. An alternate definition they have is to cancel a debt. I don't think these are bad ways to define forgiveness. And I, I don't have a qualifier for that. I think they're pretty good because they cover the fact that it, it, it is removing, I guess, the offense, it's exonerating, it's to stop feeling angry, it's removing that resentment and that anger from an offense, which would be an intentional uh, mistake or an intentional offense, which is a circular definition again. Man, I'm just going all over those today. But, or it's a flaw which is maybe something more habitual. Maybe that's just some who someone is that it bothers you and it builds up anger and resentment. And forgiveness is letting that go too, which I think can be a little tougher. And then you also have a mistake, which would be someone doing something unintentionally, kind of a one-off thing. And I think that's probably actually the easiest one to forgive. It's pretty easy to forgive mistakes because they weren't intentional and there's no malice there. I think it's it's harder to forgive something that was intentionally done to cause offense. And I think it's even harder maybe to forgive and consistently forgive a character flaw or a flaw that someone has. So I think that's a good definition, but a definition that's been more helpful to me personally is 
forgiveness is reconciling or repairing a relationship. So if you're forgiving someone, you're restoring and repairing that relationship. And that relationship might look a little different from what it did before, but the relationship is still repaired. Whether that was a friendship or a marriage or whatever, a family relationship, whatever that relationship was, it has been restored. So that's those are some of the different ways to talk about forgiveness. If, if you look for synonyms, a lot of times we'll use words like pardon and excuse and exonerate and absolve and acquit. And I'm going to stay away from those. I, I'm going to stick to forgiveness because I think each of those words misses part of what forgiveness is. If you're looking at pardon or excuse, or if you're looking at pardon or exonerate, there's almost a legal connotation for that that says consequences are removed. But if you pardon someone or exonerate someone, there might still be the resentment that lingers. If you excuse someone, you're almost you're talking your way out of whatever mistake or flaw or offense that they've committed. You're you're almost trying to make it so that the mistake they made wasn't actually a mistake. And I that's not what forgiveness is. And then you have absolve and acquit, which again I think are really legal words. Absolve is a little better, but I don't think that's more helpful for a discussion of reality because I don't think that word is particularly common in in daily conversational use and acquit again that just has this legal connotation it doesn't really have the the relationship connotation I think that forgiveness has so I'm going to stick with the word forgiveness as we go forward and this has been a really long introduction you may say you're building this up so much why does it even matter and the reason this matters is forgiveness is the core of what we do For those of you unfamiliar with Christianity, the whole reason Christianity exists is because of forgiveness. It's it's all caught up in this effort to reconcile our relationship with God. In reality, if we don't have forgiveness, if, if we don't have this reconciliation, this restoration of a relationship, none of this matters at all. So this, this reconciliation, it's, it's crucially it's port, important, it's fundamental to what we do, and it's called for again and again by scriptures. If that's not enough for you, and, and you are sincere about faith and Christianity and the scriptures, the scriptures again and again call for this forgiveness, and that's something we're going to look at going forward. And the reason it's worth talking about, the reason it's not just something we can understand and kind of have in our, in our knowledge is that it goes against our natural tendencies and our natural desires, and that's something else we're going to talk about. So I think we have to address it head on. So with that, this has been the introduction. We're going to finally get into the episode here. And the episode's title is is unique, and I'm bringing a little bit of attention to it, because usually we have real something, real gospel. But the title of this episode is simply this. It is real gospel. So as we go forward, we're going to we're gonna start in the Old Testament like we always do. And we're going to start with Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah 31, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, Though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And no longer shall one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So some textual notes on this to, to kind of explain this passage as we're going forward. There's a lot of this word, this word comes up over and over again, covenant, in this text. And to explain what that is, a covenant is an agreement. It's 
very similar to a contract in a lot of ways, but I think Covenant has a more uh, committal connotation and more of a, a personal a personal connotation. So when he's when God talks about this first covenant that he made with their fathers when he led them out of Egypt, he's talking about when God gave the Israelites the law. He says, follow these things. Do these things. Follow my commands. Be faithful to me. And that's the first covenant he talks about. But then he moves into this other covenant that is a covenant of forgiveness. And he says he's going to put his law within his people and he will write it on their hearts. And he's speaking to fostering an innate desire to follow the law where we don't need the punishment and we don't need the the other motivations. There's an innate desire. It's written on our hearts. And it goes forward and it says, I will be their God and they will be my people. God is owning his people in this new covenant. This is an incredibly comforting thing. It's incredibly comforting to belong to something, to someone who is dedicated to taking care of you, to showing you love. Um, So we have that. And then this passage concludes with, I will forgive their iniquity. Iniquity is another word for, for sin, for offense, for brokenness, rebellion, all of the evil, all of these words that we can kind of fill in for iniquity. He says, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin, their mistakes, their offenses, their flaws, no more. And one of the reasons I bring this out from Jeremiah is because I want to show that God is consistent. I think a lot of times we talk about kind of this, when we think of the God of the Old Testament, we think of an angry God who's punishing people and who's demonstrating his wrath and his power and he's, he's killing people and all these things. And we almost talk about God in the New Testament as if he's entirely different. He's an entirely different person. And he's not. God, God is incredibly consistent. Here he says, the forgiveness is here. I will forgive. I will remember their sins no more. The forgiveness is here in the Old Testament. This forgiveness is consistent. And we're not going to get into this tangent of, well, why does he punish all these people in the Old Testament? Well, we can address that at some point if you're interested. But what I want to show here is that God is consistent in his desire for mercy, not sacrifice. And mercy is another word. Uh, A lot of times we throw around words like mercy and grace. And what I want to clarify here is mercy is not giving someone something they deserve. And this has the connotation that what this refers to is mercy is not giving someone the punishment that they deserve. So if someone does something that means they should go to jail and the judge says, no, I'm, I'm not going to give you a prison sentence for whatever reason, that is mercy. While grace is giving something that is undeserved. So it would be if a student in a class I teach were to not do their homework and I were to give them a a good grade anyway, that would be grace because I'm giving them something good they don't deserve. So that's a little clarification I want to make because God is desiring mercy, not sacrifice. He's desiring to take away these punishments that are the natural consequences of our sin. You see, God's desire is to save and to protect because he has an abiding love for us, his people. And as we go forward, he promises to remember their sin, remember his people's sin no more, to remember our sins no more. And this is completely foreign to us because even when you and I forgive frequently, We still hold on to that, whatever that offense or that flaw was against us. We may say, I forgive you, but a lot of times we can still hold on to that. And maybe pull it out later in an argument saying, oh, remember that one time you did this? And that's not true forgiveness. That's not real forgiveness. So we we have this tendency to, to hold on 
to not really be sincere. And, and a lot of times we'll, we'll brush it off. Someone will say, I'm sorry. And we'll say, oh, you're good. Oh, no problem. No worries. Whatever. But we, and we still hold on. We hold on to how we have been offended, how we have been hurt. Because there, there's this idea of we forgive, but maybe we don't forget. And what, what we're told here in Jeremiah is that God does forget. The relationship is completely restored. He will not remember our sins, all the ways we rebelled against God and hurt God. He promises not to remember those. And this seems like, this is incredibly hard to believe. Why would someone do this? Why would God do this? And I think the core of that is his love for us. And all of this, this forgiveness is against our nature. Because we don't like to accept things for free. We want to think we have earned what we have. And God says, you don't have to do anything for this. I will not remember your iniquity, your sin anymore. And this is injustice. This seems like injustice to us. Maybe not necessarily when we receive this forgiveness, but when we see God forgiving other people, we say, no, they deserve to be punished. They need to be held accountable. They need to learn. And God says, no, I will remember your sin no more. So the reality here is that we do fall short. We have offenses and flaws and mistakes that we commit against God, that we hurt God with. And there's a reality to that. That's inescapable. No one is perfect. No one listening to this podcast is perfect. You have fallen short in some way. I have fallen short in some way. But the real gospel here is that God forgives us. We are members of this new covenant. We are totally forgiven. Our mistakes, our flaws, our evil, our wickedness, our our causes for hurt are not remembered by God anymore. And this leads us into the gospel, this fact that we are joyfully forgiven. We are freely and completely and totally forgiven. It leads us into our gospel, which is a verse I'm sure a lot of you have heard before because it's probably one of the most quoted verses in the world. It's John 3.16. I'm going to go through verse 18, but we're going to start in John 3.16 where it says, For God so loved the world... That he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. So what this is saying is belief in God assures our forgiveness. And it's really weird that Christians in, in our society today are known for judgment and hypocrisy. When this verse that's at the core of our faith says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But in order that the world might be saved through him. We should be paragons. We should be examples of forgiveness and mercy and grace. We shouldn't be known for judgment. And that's on us. That isn't the fault of people who think we're judgmental or hypocritical. That's because we don't live with enough forgiveness. We don't actually reflect that into our lives. Because what is promised here is true forgiveness. Our relationship with God is restored. We're promised eternal life, those eternal consequences of our sin that would have had us separated from God forever. Those consequences are removed. We have eternal work, and this is all a work of God. And at this point, I want to step into a little bit of a tangent. And this is a tangent on, frankly, a little bit of theological language that I think is worth talking about, is worth explaining And that is works righteousness. This idea that we somehow have to earn our forgiveness. Or we have to earn our place in heaven. And that's... (laughs) That's wrong. And this takes all kinds of different forms. Yes, there's this, we have to be a good enough person. But there's also the forms of works works righteousness that 
You have to believe the right things the right way. And we earn by believing the right way or understanding enough or all these other things that we think if we do this enough, then we have earned our forgiveness. And the truth is we don't. We can't earn our own forgiveness. We are, we are forgiven because God so loved the world. So works righteousness are all these ways we try to earn our forgiveness. And the truth is we don't. We don't earn our forgiveness. It's given to us freely. So the reality of this is, as we put John 3.16 before us, is, is there's a tough lesson here that we cannot fulfill expectations God has for us on our own. It is impossible. We cannot live up to the standards set before us. And we deserve ultimate condemnation. You, me, and everyone, each of us knows, deserves to go to hell. That is the reality of our situation. But the gospel here is that God loves us. He doesn't want that for us. And we are totally, freely, completely forgiven. If we are in Christ. We are a new creation. We are forgiven and cleansed. Our sins, our mistakes, our, our everything, it's not held against us anymore. And we don't have to earn that. You see, because now there's nothing we can do to destroy our relationship with a God who loves us. And that's incredible. And that's kind of where I want to leave this forgiveness between us and God. We, it's all a work of God. There's nothing we can do in that realm. But there's another realm of forgiveness, and that is uh, another area of forgiveness. And that's between us and the people around us, our friends, our family, our neighbors, our acquaintances, our co-workers. And for that, I want to direct us to Ephesians 3, 31, where we're told, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So, for those of you who are unfamiliar, Ephesians is one of the epistles, which is a fancy word. It's, it's letters that people wrote to the, ch- the early church. And they were written to churches who were struggling in, in some way. So, the church at, at Ephesus, the Ephesians at the church at Ephesus, were struggling with bitterness and wrath and anger and arguments and slander and... With, they were struggling with being kind and tender-hearted and forgiving. And I think this is something that you and I can probably identify with. Because we are, we are called to forgive, but a lot of times we, we don't like to. We like to cling to our anger. You see, because in our forgiveness, we are called to forgive. And we are... We have been called to forgive as God and Christ forgave us because we have to realize we've been forgiven a much greater debt. You see, no one has sinned against you as much as you have sinned against God. That is a definite statement. That is a fact. That is not, there is no flexibility on that. There are no exceptions to that rule. No one has sinned against you as much as you have sinned against God, and God forgave you. Completely, totally, freely. And the practicality of this is that we have to let our wrath and our anger and our our clamor, our arguments and our slander go. And this is a choice. It's not an easy choice, and I accept that because sometimes we have been hurt profoundly, deeply, And it's really hard to let go of that hurt and that anger and that desire for justice for ourselves. But we have to choose to let it go. And if it comes back up in our hearts and our minds, we say, I have forgiven this person. Their sin is no more. And this violates our sense of justice. We think if someone sinned against me, they they deserve to pay for it. It violates our sense of fair play, saying it's not fair if they are unpunished. It's not fair if they don't have to suffer like I suffered. And at its core, it also it violates our sense of self-preservation. 
Because if we just forgive and we move on, what's to stop them from doing it again if they haven't been punished for it? And we're afraid that we're going to suffer this hurt again, whatever it is. Because the reality is we like our grudges. We feel like we deserve justice. But the gospel here is that we are forgiven. And we're given the ability to pass that on to one another. We're given the freedom to forgive in turn. Because we have the freedom to also ask for forgiveness when we sin and when we hurt and when we offend and have flaws and make mistakes that affect our neighbors and our friends and our family. And that is joy. So the summary, the summary of this whole podcast, if we're going to break it down, it's as simple as this. We have sinned against God. We have made mistakes. We are flawed. We, we do things we shouldn't and we don't do things we should all the time. But God says, I love you, I forgive you, and there's nothing you have to do to earn that. You are forgiven. Your sin is no more. I do not remember it. Our relationship with God is restored. And the challenge that comes with this is we are called to to act similarly toward our our friends, our neighbors, the people around us, our coworkers. When they make mistakes, when they are flawed, when they offend us, when they hurt us, we are called to forgive them as God forgave us and remember their sins no more. To repair and restore and reconcile those relationships. And that's the conclusion. And the reality of this is it's hard and it's tough. And we can have a discussion about what it means to to do this in individual situations. And if you're struggling with this, please reach out to me. I'm not going to make a podcast out of it, but I would love to talk with you and counsel you in that way and be a support for you in that way. But the truth is we are called to forgive and we're, we're called to forgive without reservation, without hesitation. We're called to go forward and forgive as God forgave us. And that's a challenge, but we do rest in the fact that as we struggle with that, we are forgiven for all the times that we fail. This has been Real Life, Real Gospel, again, hosted by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida. I've been your host, uh, Josh Laborious. It's, it's a pleasure to host this every week. I hope it was helpful to you. If it is your first time listening, welcome. We're, we're glad that you're here. And all of our episodes are still published on all of those websites I listed earlier. We have Spotify, Google Podcast, iTunes, YouTube, Podbean. So if this is your first time and you, you think this was helpful, which I, I pray it was for you, go back. We, we have 10 previous episodes that I think are of very helpful and applicable topics to our daily lives. So I would encourage you, check those out. And the final note I have for you before we we sign off is that next week there will not be a podcast. I am on vacation. I am going to see family in St. Louis. So I will not be in the office recording a podcast. My apologies about that. So I will, we will return in two weeks and I look forward to that time with you. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.